what are three of the most impactful things that you have changed your opinion on in nutrition specifically? Um, and let's make it recent because I know for any of us, if we go back a decade, it's an eternity in terms of our understanding of nutrition science or something like that. But let's pick a narrower window of maybe like three or four years. Mm -hmm. What would be sort of three areas where your your opinion has really changed in a manner that actually leads to either a different behavior in you or a different um, coaching input to your clients? I can think of three things right away. All right. So first thing being uh, LDL cholesterol. So uh, when I got to grad school, um, the the kind of the the narrative and even out of the lab I was in was, uh, it's really, we don't think it's LDL. It's more the HDL to LDL ratio and the particle size and those sorts of things. And I, I kept that probably until about five years ago, four years ago. And I just saw enough of these Mendelian randomizations come out. It's like, wow, that's pretty powerful when you look at the mortality rate and it is like linear with the exposure, the lifetime exposure to LDL. I'm like, eh can't really hold this belief anymore because it's just not supported by the data. Uh, and it actually, um, changed my opinion on like, you know, now I'm a little bit more conscious about the saturated fat I consume. Uh, we talked about, like I actually started taking a low dose of a statin, uh, and that's helped. That's brought, so I've never had super high LDL, but I've always been around 150 to 125, even if I reduce my saturated fat, increase my fiber. And I eat probably 60, 70 grams of fiber a day. Mm. So, um, you know, I think people get that one twisted a little bit because they'll hear things like, well, it doesn't consider HDL. It doesn't consider this thing. No, you, you have to understand what an independent risk factor means. It means that all things being equal, are you better off having higher HDL? Yeah. But HDL is more of a marker of metabolic health because we have some drug trials and, and Mendelian randomizations now where they modulate HDL and it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Yeah. Um, whereas if you modulate LDL, so even at high HDL or low HDL, in both stratifications, lower LDL is almost always better for cardiovascular disease and mortality. I feel like I need to do a podcast on Mendelian randomization. Um, I write about it in my book. Um, and I actually, very powerful. yeah, it's a, and, and I understand why it doesn't get more attention because you do have to really get into the weeds of genetic sorting and the statistical methods that are involved. But I actually, in the book, write about it as one of the five pillars of evidence that we should be relying on as we formulate, uh, insights with respect to anything that we do. So that's an interesting one. Um, and, and, and obviously it has a parallel piece, which is around the, your relationship to saturated fat. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is when you're looking at mortality, cardiovascular disease, this is where nutrition science can become so limited. And the power with Mendelian randomization is you're kind of looking at a lifetime randomized control trial. That's right. Right. So people will point out things like the, the Minnesota coronary study. Um, and I think there's another Australian study and they said, well, look at this randomized control trial where they, you know, looked at high saturated fat versus low saturated fat. And there wasn't a difference or, you know, that sort of thing. And one of the biggest problems with those studies is, you know, they're two years, which is a really long time for a randomized control trial. But when you're talking about a disease that is a, a lifetime exposure, two years in people that are in their forties. I mean, you're just not going to have that many incidences to pick up on. So when you're looking at Mendelian randomization, you can get around that because you're looking at people across their lifetimes. And the way I kind of explain, and I don't consider myself a lipid expert, but the way I try to explain like lifetime exposure risks is imagine if you and I start investing, yeah, right. And you get in at 8%. We both invest $10,000. You get an 8%, I get in at 6%. If we look after a year or two, I mean, you'll have more, but it, it, won't, it yeah. won't be like statistically different, right? But if we look at four years, you're going to have a lot more. And I don't know how much exactly, but my guess is it's going to be magnitudes of times greater because you're, again, lifetime exposure. Actually, I've done this exercise 
and it was initially in my book. I actually used this exact analysis. Oh, really? Was a thousand dollars invested at? I think I chose six percent versus four uh percent, -huh. or maybe it was even six versus five. It was something that was small enough that at five and ten years wasn't enormous, but at forty, fifty, and sixty years was staggering. Yep. And that was the exact point, which is the cumulative effect of compounding over a lifetime is so nonlinear that I don't think we are capable of understanding it. Like I don't think we can ever cognitively realize it until we literally just do the calculations and they're yeah. staring us in the face. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that again, that's one thing I changed my mind on that I was pretty, had a pretty strong belief about it. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, well, how much evidence do you need? Like, you know, we, we still have kind of LDL denialists out there. And I think uh, it's one of the, I think it's one of the most dangerous things I see actually. Yeah. I mean, like you have the mechanism, the penetration of the endothelium. It's very clear that that happens. We have the animal models that show linear dose dependent effects. You have the Mendelian uh, randomization and you have the clinical trials in humans. It's we're, And we're, you have the prospective cohort studies. And then you have the, you have the genetic studies. So, right. You have right. the PCSK9 over and yep. under expressors. So, so um, I want to come back to the M Minnesota heart study in a moment, yep. but let's go on and hear the other two. Yeah. So uh, supplemental branch chain amino acids, that's okay. another one. I, I used to be a big advocate for that. In fact, uh, the first supplement company I had uh, five years ago, we sold a product with branch chain amino acids in it. And then my my current supplement company, Outwork Nutrition, we do not have a branch chain amino acid product because- and That was basically taking the three branch chain amino acids as an in-workout supplement? Uh, as a post-workout recovery okay. supplement. I still do think there may be a small benefit for delayed onset muscle soreness with branch chains that may be outside of just regular protein, but based on the cost and honestly, like the, the negative impact on taste too, because that's- a, The leucine's horrible, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I used to, I think I've even told you this before, I used to spike five grams of leucine into my water during a workout. Ooh. I mean, it's the most awful tasting. Is Horrible. do any other does, is there any other amino acid that tastes as bad as leucine? Probably some of the sulfur based ones, yeah. you know, cysteine or uh, methionine. methionine or yeah, um, no, it's pretty bad. And the fact it's also nonpolar, so it, it doesn't dissolve. Yeah, it doesn't dissolve well. You're kind of, you're shaking it constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was a big advocate for that. I was sponsored by a company called Salvation for years that had a branched amino acid product. Um, has the rest of the world caught up to that or a are BCAAs bit. still a big product? They still are a big product. Yeah. They still are a big product. But most evidence-based folks, you know, will say, hey, we just, there's. It's not really it's moving not, the needle. It's not better than protein, yep. right? In fact, the actual, the research tends to suggest whey protein is actually better than branch chains, uh, even when you equate for the dose of branch chains and the protein. Uh, hmm. So yeah, I just kind of got to the point where I'm like, if I, if I put this in the products, I'm just doing it because my, you know, I'm tied to branch chains, right? Like people are expecting this from me mm -hmm. because like my PhD was in leucine and the branch chain amino acid and, and, and the metabolism and uh, their effects on muscle protein synthesis. But I just, I couldn't hold that position anymore based on the evidence because it was just too strong. Um, and then the other one that I have now lost in my brain. Oh, <laughs> oh um, so the idea that, um, I used to really kind of discourage people from intermittent fasting. So the other thing I changed my opinion on was uh, intermittent fasting, uh, in at least in terms of like your traditional 16-8. Uh, because I used to say, well, I'm, I'm worried about the, the catabolic effects of it, yep. uh, you know, that sort of thing. At least when combined with resistance training and sufficient total protein, and the, the caveat should be that they also, the, in these studies, they train within their feeding window. There's some really good studies by Grant Tinsley on this. Um, there doesn't appear to be at least not statistically significant differences in lean mass between people who uh, do 16-8 intermittent fasting versus people who just eat continuously. So I used to be like somebody like, well, you know, really like every four hours you should be getting a protein dose, that sort of thing maybe if you plot it out over 30 years, it'll make a difference on how much lean mass you gain. So I would still say if you're somebody who is a bodybuilder and you want to absolutely squeeze out every last ounce of muscle that you can get, 
I still would say like any form of intermittent fasting probably isn't optimal, but for the average person, can you get plenty strong, plenty big and uh, still do intermittent fasting? At least the 16, eight, I would say absolutely. Which is really interesting because I've kind of gone the other way from you. Yeah, you were saying. I, I'm, I used to be a big proponent and then what I was seeing clinically, so this was really just anecdotal, but when you see it over and over and over and right. over again on so many patients on whom you have DEXA data and um, was we were seeing a real deterioration of body composition. Now, were they def still definitely getting enough total protein? No, and that's my point. Yeah. So what I know was happening was they were falling behind on protein. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes one of efficacy versus effectiveness. In other words, the data which are done under controlled settings say, if I control for total protein, it can be identical. But the effectiveness version of that is in practice, do people make that happen? And I, I guess what I would say is we weren't seeing it. Yeah. So we still use intermittent fasting in patients as one of the three big levers of energy restriction, but we have a big red caution button all over it that says, if you choose this, instead of caloric restriction or dietary restriction, if you wanna choose time restriction as your lever, you're going to have to go out of your way to make sure you are not compromising protein. Yeah, and I think one of the things I'll, I'll tell people is, and I can I can like do dogmatism over all these different disciplines, yeah. including what I like, which is flexible dieting, but people get too hung up on the actual fasting part of intermittent fasting. You're, you're reducing your energy intake. Yeah. It's a tool, and a lot of people, it works great. Like they, they say, I'm not hungry. Um, it didn't feel like I was dieting. Awesome. But so people will say, well, can I, is it going to break a fast if I have coffee? Uh, will it break a fast if I chew gum? Will it break a fast if I have a, a protein shake? And what I'll say is like, well, why are you fasting? Yeah. And, and usually if they're like, um, and, and by the way, I'm only laughing because I'm guilty of this. Right. Right. Like right. I, I used to really think about the details of that. Um, and, and that, you know, I just don't think, look, I think autophagy is an incredibly important part of our ability to uh, regenerate. Mm -hmm. I just don't think there's a chance you're getting any meaningful amount of it in 16 hours. And therefore, you know, to your point, we would even tell patients now to have a protein shake outside of that feeding window. In fact, in fact I think you and I even spoke about that yeah. idea, yeah. which was if it's really all about energy restriction, what's an extra 200 calories outside of your feeding window? Exactly. And actually, if you look at some of the effects of high protein diets, they actually are not dissimilar from some of the effects you get from fasting, at least in like liver metabolism and whatnot. So, you know, I would say to somebody, well, you know, don't worry about breaking your fast in terms of your eating something. Like, you know, if you're worried about it, intermittently fast your carbohydrate and fat intake yeah. and just have an extra dose of protein in the morning, like, or essential amino acids or, or whatever you want, right? Because now you're getting that anabolic stimulus spreading it out a little bit more. You're making sure you get enough total protein in during the day. And quite honestly, I mean, this is a, a theory that uh, Dr. Lehman and I had, which was, you know, breakfast probably is the most important protein dosing of the day mm -hmm. because you are coming off, you know, you know, a significant period of fasting. And then if you're extending that out, like how much longer are you extending that out? What does that mean? You know, the long term. <laughs> Thank you.